Um, I, I think we can start. I can see more participants filling in. So maybe we can just get started to stay on track. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Today, we are very happy to have with us Kevin, Preeti, and Mark to discuss international arbitration and corporate governance disputes. To briefly introduce our speakers, our first speaker today is Kevin Nash, the Registrar of the Singapore International Arbitration Center, who leads the SEAC Secretariat in the provision of case management services. For the past decade, Kevin has overseen the administration of thousands of international cases under all versions of the SEAC rules and the answer trial arbitration rules. Kevin is qualified as a barrister and a solicitor with the Law Society of Upper Canada. Thank you for joining us today, Kevin, despite the time zone. I know it's very early in Singapore. Thank you. Moving on to our second speaker, Preeti Bagnani is a partner at Wyden Case, specializing in international arbitration. Preeti has counseled clients in a range of corporate disputes, including M&As, joint ventures, and shareholder agreements. She is a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, holds degrees in New York, English, and Singapore law, and is qualified to practice in New York and Singapore. Very happy to have you with us today, Preeti. Thank you. Our third speaker today is Mark McDonald, who is a partner at Cleary Gottlieb. Mark focuses on high-stake mergers and acquisition litigation, as well as complex commercial litigation and arbitration, including disputes involving corporate governance, private equity, and real estate. Mark graduated from New York University School of Law with a JD degree. Glad you can join us today, Mark. Thanks for having me. Um, before we dive right into the subject of our discussion, maybe we can take a step back for the benefit of our younger members in the audience and talk a bit about corporate governance disputes. Preeti, if we could start with you, what are the most common types of corporate governance disputes that you see being referred to arbitration? Sure, I'm happy to, to kick it off. Uh, I wanna just say thank you, Aishali, thank you to the Stanford um, International Arbitration Association and the Rock Center for Governance for hosting this panel and, and inviting me. I'm delighted to participate. This is a really interesting issue. Uh, we are seeing, I think, increasing interest in international arbitration uh, for corporate governance disputes. And there are some areas where um, arbitration is common and has been used for a long time with, with little controversy. And there are other areas where uh, I think there is a greater deal of con controversy and we don't see arbitration used quite as much. And I, maybe we'll talk through um, each of those types of, of disputes. Um, so where we see arbitration used a lot is disputes between shareholders of a corporation or members of an LLC or sometimes unincorporated JVs between the participants of unincorporated JVs in a close corporation. So limited number of shareholders, not a publicly traded company. Typically there is a shareholders agreement in place that has been signed by all the parties. And those are where disputes um, you know, are, are often, and in particular where parties are from different jurisdictions, those are where disputes are often arbitrated. Um, disputes may arise where a minority shareholder disagrees with the majority shareholder's decision. Um, the shareholder's agreement typically will provide for remedies in the event of deadlocks, say a buyout or a dissolution of the company, and parties often provide for arbitration, and that can even be as an adjunct to one of those other remedies. So, for example, um, where there, whether there is, in fact, a deadlock that would trigger one of those remedies like a buyout, uh, or in the event there is a buyout for the arbitrators to determine the fair market value of the shares, it's just some examples. Um, and arbitration typically works quite well in those types of situations. Um, you may have scenarios where a majority or a controlling shareholder doesn't even adhere to the voting thresholds that are required for certain decisions. I have a case right now that's that's of that nature where, where the minority shareholder is, um, the, the dispute arises because the controlling shareholder has ignored the vo voting requirements and passed a budget, for example, that ignores the fact that budgets have to be unanimously approved. And that, uh, that agreement, that LLC agreement is governed by Delaware law 
but provides for AAA arbitration. Um, so that's sort of one, one example. Um, disputes are also, also have often arisen out of M&As. Um, Post M&A disputes are very common. Um, you may have minority shareholders that are forced, that are dragged because they're drag along rights and they're unhappy because they have been treated unequally and they bring claims against the majority shareholder. Again, under the shareholders agreement, those types of issues do come up uh, and they are often arbitrated. Um, where arbitration I think has been less common or more controversial, um, is in relation to, uh, say, federal securities claims. Um, those types of claims often ale typically allege that a corporation or its directors have made, say, a material misrepresentation to the public that artificially inflates the value of the stock. They're typically pursued by way of a class action. And that's because for the majority of shareholders, the loss that suffered isn't large enough to cover the substantial cost of pursuing a claim like that. Um, and class arbitrations, as we know, are, are rare in arbitration. And so um, that's why where a corporation's bylaws say has an arbitration clause, even then claims would typically proceed on an individual basis. And that may disincentivize uh, individuals from bringing federal securities claims because the cost of bringing such claims is so high. And that's where we see greater controversy as to whether arbitration is an appropriate um, way to resolve those types of disputes. Um, so I've said a lot. I, I might I might pause there and and happy to circle back to this um, further down the line. Yeah, um, thanks, Vicky. That that's actually very helpful. It gives us all a lot of context. And just to, to pick up on on what you were saying about having um, arbitration clauses and shareholder agreements, maybe and, and I'll I'll give it a mark on this. Um, where do you usually find, like which corporate documents or agreements ought to contain international arbitration clauses? Where do you usually find these clauses? Yeah, um, and, and uh, thank you again for having me. It's great to be here. I totally agree with everything Preeti said. Um, I, you know, in terms of uh, where we most often see, at least in my experience, um, most often see arbitration clauses uh, tend to be in, um, as Preeti said, uh, closely held companies, LLCs um, in their operating agreements, um, in, for example, shareholder level agreements, um, you know, agreements between two or more shareholders as to how they will exercise their shareholder rights. Um, or transaction related agreements, um, M&A agreements, um, things of that nature, asset purchases, share purchases. Um, and uh, most, and, and so um, those are the kind of categories where you tend to see it, um, where you don't tend to see, at least in the US arbitration agreements are in what I would refer to as a company or a particular a corporations constitutive documents, the bylaws or the certificate of incorporation. And the reason for that is uh, most corporations in the United States are incorporated in Delaware, or at least most large corporations. Um, and in Delaware, it's actually statutorily prohibited to um, require uh, shareholders to litigate what are called internal affairs claims. So claims for a breach of fiduciary duty or interpretation of the certificate of incorporation or bylaws um, in any place other than the Delaware Court of Chancery, which means that you can't force shareholders to arbitrate those claims with respect to corporations. Now, that's among many reasons why a lot of entities um, are formed that are not corporations, LLCs, partnerships, um, and other alternative entities. Um, but, you know, there, there's with a corporation, at least in the US, at least in Delaware, there's far less flexibility. And so we don't see a lot of uh, arbitration, um, you know, involving corporations in the US. That having been said, there, there are shareholder agreements involving corporations or M&A agreements involving corporations. 
um, that do have arbitration clauses. So even with respect to corporations, you still do see arbitration. Um, and you know, we'll get into the sort of pros and cons of arbitration versus litigation um, as we get into the discussion today. I think, but you know, I do agree with Preeti that um, you know the the most sort of classic case uh, for uh, including arbitration agreements um, in any of these situations is where you have um, cross border parties. Um, you know, that's where you typically see it. It is not uncommon with, you know, purely domestic entity or counterparties, but usually you see it um, in the international context. Thanks, Mark. That, that's again helpful, especially in the U.S. context. Um, Kevin, I'm, I'm kind of curious to hear what, what you think about this, um, especially in the Asian market. Sure. Uh, or thank you. Thank you. It's it's great to be here. I, I might be in the position where I'm now seconding or thirding the interventions of, of Preeti and Mark, but uh, I think for us, the cl classic case might be uh, a share purchase agreement along alongside a shareholders agreement, or it could be a joint venture vehicle. I think Mark's point about the international nature of some of these transactions is important uh, because the question really is what kind of agreements ought uh, to international arbitration to be used? Where should they be used? So if you had, say, a Northeast Asian investor, say, Korean party, Singapore party, there's a JV vehicle uh, in, in Vietnam. Uh, do you want to go to local courts or do you want to go to arbitration? You've got an intersection of jurisdictions, uh, multiple agreements, multiple parties. And I think that's where the advantages of arbitration uh, really reveal themselves. So, so we all know the reasons why we choose arbitration. It's uh, a creature of contract. It's flexible. It's fast, cost effective, limited avenues of appeal, confidentiality, which can be important in these in these types of disputes. Uh, and then ultimately, enforceability. So those are the are the kind of cases that we see most often, but we also see uh, of course, disputes arising out of mergers and acquisitions uh, and some disputes between shareholders and uh, boards, company bylaws and articles of association. So there are, of course, some attendant challenges to those kind of disputes. And I think Preeti might have indicated that you could have, uh, if you've amended those articles uh, to provide for arbitration, you could have uh, an arbitration about the amendment uh, to arbitration. I think one of the things that we look at, uh, especially with some of these types of disputes, is how we're able to customize our processes in order to cater for those disputes. So we can talk uh, as we go about the different mechanisms and how they apply to these uh, types of corporate governance disputes. Yeah, thanks, Kevin. That's helpful. And maybe I'll, I'll get back to Preeti on this. Um, since we have brought up bylaws and that, that there is some resistance to including arbitration clauses in a company's bylaws. Uh, and this is particularly because it raises questions on manufactured consent. How would you address these issues? And is there a way that we can overcome this? Uh, oh, Preeti, I think it's on mute. Sorry about that, you can hear me now. Um, so maybe let me start with the challenge with consent. And then if we have a bit of time, I might turn to uh, discussing a related challenge, um, which arises because of the multi-party nature of any <laughs> such proceedings. Um, so the Federal Arbitration Act in the US requires that arbitration clauses in contracts must be enforced according to its terms. And courts um, and commentators in the US have said that corporate bylaws are akin to ordinary contracts between shareholders. And on that basis, uh, courts have enforced arbitration clauses in the bylaws, even of public companies. And as you noted, there is some resistance to this one of the arguments is that when the arbitration clause is found in the bylaws, there isn't genuine consent. Um, shareholders in a public corporation don't sign a document, right? They don't to signal their acceptance of arbitration where it's in, in the bylaws. They may not even know about the arbitration clause. And so the consent is sort of inferred uh, from the fact that they 
maintain their interest in the company and their shares, uh, provided that they have at least some sort of notice of um, the arbitration agreement. And so that's uh, where courts have sort of focused. Um, they've focused on, and they've refused to, to order arbitration where the only contractual basis was a provision in the bylaws and there was no evidence that the shareholder was ever provided a copy of the bylaw or ever informed of the existence of the arbitration clause and never signed any document that referred to the arbitration provision. Um, so some of the ways in which corporations could address this concern would be by taking affirmative steps to bring the arbitration provision to the attention of the shareholders. I think most prominently, uh, if, you, if you have it in the ar on the share certificate, an arbitration provision, ideally the scope is, is also spelled out. Um, and if there is a selection of a particular institution, you know, institutional rules, that should ideally also be brought to the shareholders' attention. Um, other ways, perhaps less uh, ideal, would be informing the shareholders of the existence of the arbitration agreement in, say, an annual report or SEC filing. Um, there is a, also, if you take a step back, a, a more fundamental debate about whether bylaws are even contractual in the sense intended by the FAA. And that, I'm not gonna get into that debate for purposes of this discussion. I think there's a, 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 you know, a ton to discuss there and it's, it's interesting and it's important. Um, but I'll just say that that debate matters because the FAA preempts state law where state law attempts to limit contracts to arbitrate. And so if corporate charters and bylaws are, are contracts, then arguably no state has the power to forbid the use of arbitration clauses in the corporate governance document. But I'll, I'll maybe pa park that debate uh, for another day. Um, I did wanna say uh, something about the challenge of multi-party proceedings. Uh, one of the questions that, that arises is should bylaws provide a detailed procedure for the appointment of arbitrators um, in, a, in, in a case uh, where you have multiple parties, multiple claimants, for example, um, is there a need for that? Um, and here I, I, I'd be interested in Kevin's thoughts as well, but I think that as to the appointment of arbitrators specifically, um, if the bylaws provide for institutional arbitration and selects one of the rules of the major arbitral institutions like the SIAC rules, then typically it's not necessary to provide for detailed procedures for the appointment of arbitrators because the major arbitral rules already have default selection procedures and those rules are typically satisfactory. They'll provide, for example, that if it's a three member tribunal, all the claimants have to jointly nominate an arbitrator, all the respondents have to jointly nominate. And if there is a lack of agreement, then they have backup procedures and critically, all of the major rules will provide that if multiple parties on one side can't agree, then all the arbitrators will be appointed by the institution. And that's important uh, because you wanna make sure that, that you avoid arguments that there has been unequal treatment because the parties on one side have been able to appoint arbitrators, but the parties on the other side have not. Um, so, I. I Maybe I'll, let me pause there and, and see if there are other comments on, on these topics. Yeah, I, I think um, I'm also curious to hear what Kevin has to say about this, especially from an institutional context. Does SEAC, for example, have any procedural safeguards uh, to ensure that arbitration would continue despite these challenges? Sure. I'll, uh, Preeti, thanks very much for... Uh... For bringing uh, for bringing that up, it's it's actually one of my favorite favorite topics, uh, multi multi party appointments. And there's some nuance to this on how how the institutions do it. And I very much agree with Preeti's point on not being overly prescriptive in arbitration clauses because all of the institutional rules provide for for those procedures. So I I always take the view that there's a distinction between a multi party appointment and a multi polar appointment. And when you're uh, say in a three member tribunal, if you have multiple claimants or multiple respondents, uh, you have to look at the relationship between the claimant group and the respondent group. Because the question is, 
and we would all be familiar with the holding in duck code. This is why the institutions will take the view that in order to make things fair for everyone, we are going to appoint all the arbitrators. So no one gets the right to nominate an arbitrator. But you're really looking at the relationship within those groups. You don't necessarily want to appoint, take away a party's right to nominate if all of the parties are aligned. So it depends on the type of dispute that we're looking here, whether it's a derivative action, oppression, class or arbitration, class action. So I think that's very important. And sometimes the way if you have provided for the appointment procedure and say you have a single claimant in a multi-party, I think it's likely uh, notwithstanding sort of the uh, express agreement versus an incorporated agreement, those institutional rules are likely to prevail. But there are a lot of these procedural uh, safeguards that go to the contractual relationship along the way uh, in institutional arbitration. And I guess the starting point would be whether or not a party uh, who feels like they have been improperly arrayed in the arbitration wants to make uh, a prima facie jurisdictional objection. So a party may have included uh, or uh, non-signatories to the arbitration agreement. And then as a respondent, you can say, there is not a valid and existing arbitration agreement against me. Uh, I make an objection uh, to the jurisdiction of this arbitration over me. And that can allow uh, a respondent to get out of the arbitration before the tribunal is constituted. That's a relatively low bar. Most of these tricky questions, part particularly in these type of disputes, are going to go uh, to the tribunal. Uh, and then once you get to a tribunal, I think there's other mechanisms that you can look at. I think early dismissal has become a very popular procedure. Uh, we have in our in our new draft seventh edition of the SIC rules that are out for public consultation, you can have a preliminary determina determination on a point of law. When you're dealing with multiple claimants or multiple respondents, or if you have, say, uh, an SPA and a, an SHA, uh, you are going to have uh, multiple contracts multiple arbitration agreements so then consolidation uh can be can be an effective tool you have to look at this uh quite closely though i think specifically in these types of disputes of making sure that there are those necessary connecting factors uh to be able to collapse two or sometimes even many more arbitrations uh into a single procedure i think what we look at in arbitration for these types of disputes as well say if you went to share valuation again thinking about the economy that's important in our economy and efficiency that's important in arbitration is that you might have different stages of proceedings. So you got to could have proceedings that are are bifurcated, trifurcated. So you might uh, get to liability first uh, or jurisdiction, then liability in the second phase. And then parties are maybe able to settle out their disputes thereafter and in corporate governance and and. I guess there may be a debate on whether confidentiality is a hallmark uh, of ar arbitration, uh, but SIC, of course, has very robust confidentiality provisions, and this can be uh, important uh, as well, subject to those limited carve-outs that might be necessary. Yeah, thanks, Kevin. That That's, again, very helpful. Um, since we are on the topic of bylaws, Mark, maybe I can ask you this question. What happens if a corporation adopts an arbitration clause in its bylaws, provided that the seat of the arbitral proceedings is different from its incorporation, that is like a foreign seat? Yeah. Um, just before I answer that question, which is a good one, I, I just want to uh, make one comment on something pretty said, which I think is fascinating. I agree. The question of whether I, I'm raised the, the Delaware statute that says um, no Delaware corporation can have um, an arbitration uh, clause in its bylaws. Um, the question whether that's preempted by the FAA, I've always thought is a very interesting one. But that statute has been on the books for, I don't know, eight seven, eight years, something like that. It's been a while. And as far as I can tell, nobody has actually litigated that question. And I'm not going to take a position on it either, but I just throw that out there, that that is a hugely uh, impactful question that for some reason nobody has, um, as far as I know, uh, uh, sought to uh, actually litigate. So in terms of put aside, um, you know, maybe Delaware corporations, um, uh, where nobody seems to have uh, tried to answer your question, Vachali. Um, the uh, in another, you know, in, in an entity incorporated somewhere else, or even um, let's say in an alternative entity's um, operating agreement or partnership agreement, um, you often do see, in, in my experience at least, um, a 
uh, separation between um, the organizing law and the seat of arbitration. Um, you know, in, in particular, my experience um, in cross-border um, uh, situations where you have like a, a major investor who's usually either American or you know, let's let's focus on that example. Um, investing in a company in Asia or investing in a company in Latin America, they may very well agree to have a seat of arbitration near where the company is, where they're you know that they're investing, but want to have New York or Delaware law govern um, and have the entity incorporated there. Um, and I, you know, I, I don't think it's. Um, any different from any other sort of cross-border case where there's going to be, um, you know, different uh, legal regimes sort of like meeting uh, together and, uh, you know, does it complicate things sometimes? Sure. But uh, in my experience, um, you know, the, the ability for the parties and the tribunal to uh, apply, you know, laws of, of different, um, uh, different countries or different states that, uh, you know, may be slightly less familiar to them is, you know, it, it's actually um, uh, not uh, all that difficult in practice. And frankly, you know, if, if you are thinking about an arbitration like that, you know, that goes into your uh, arbitrator selection, right, so, to the point that Kevin was making, right? So if you have uh, an arbitration seated in Singapore, but it's governed by Delaware law, right? I mean, do you want a Singapore lawyer? Or do you want a Delaware lawyer, right? I mean, so this is all part of the thought process when um, you're thinking about um, who you want to decide or dispute. Yeah, thanks, Marco. Like you said, that is a question that has not been answered, but that's really helpful to know. Um, since we were, again, talking a little about corporate law in law, when we learn about corporate law in law school, we tend to learn about corporate governance through court decisions. And that's like Mark mentioned, usually through Delaware courts. And I think this brings us to the, the underlying theme is that is with courts building jurisprudence on corporate governance, is arbitration still considered to be a preferred form of resolving disputes in a company? And, and maybe Preeti, we can have you answer this first. Sure, yeah. Um, I'm not going to say that arbitration is always the best for every type of corporate governance dispute. Uh, I, I think there it, it depends, but I'll speak more generally to what are the advantages of international arbitration and I, I do think that there, the advantages are greater where you have cross-border uh, situations, as, as I think speakers have already mentioned. Um, and I think that the fact that courts are building jurisprudence um, doesn't actually take away from that in any way. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll say a little bit about why. Um, so. As I mentioned, I think when parties are from different countries, then the, the advantages of arbitration are, are even sharper and greater, um, right? Arbitral awards are enforceable globally. Um, that's not so for uh, every court judgment. Worldwide enforceability is typically the number one reason that parties choose international arbitration. Um, arbitration offers a neutral forum when parties are from different countries and, and typically in, in those scenarios, neither side wants to litigate in the other party's home courts. Um, arbitration is private. Um, so they are, the hearings are typically not public and it can be confidential if parties provide for confidentiality in their agreement or if they choose institutional rules that provide for confidentiality like the SIEC rules, as, as Kevin mentioned. Um, and parties have input on the selection of, of arbitrators. And so this is where I think your question comes in. If, if courts have developed, um, a, 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 if courts have developed detailed rules in, in Delaware, 
Uh, and so it's, it's a well-developed system for the types of disputes that you expect will arise out of your contract, you can choose Delaware law to govern your shareholder agreement, right? And you can choose when it comes to selecting arbitrators, a retired Delaware judge, um, if you want them to apply Delaware law in the way that Delaware judges typically apply Delaware law. And so that flexibility in the selection of arbitrators um, in, in some ways allows you to get the best of, of both worlds. Um, uh, it all Arbitration also allows the parties to choose arbitrators with necessary expertise to decide the, the dispute. And that may not be legal expertise, it may be industry expertise. In some cases, you have a combination of issues. Some are corporate governance legal issues and some are more industry specific issues. And so as, as there's always uh, a balance and a trade-off to be, to be made when selecting arbitrators. Uh, but the key point is you, you have that ability that you don't have in, in, in the courts. Um, the process can be flexible, the procedure can be flexible, and judicial review of awards is restricted to very limited issues. And so time and cost savings are, are possible for those reasons. Um, discovery is often streamlined um, and, and much more limited, and that also can, can be a huge saving of time and cost. And so those, I think, are some of the advantages uh, and some of the reasons why um, people choose arbitration and, and, and even for disputes that may involve some of these um, corporate governance issues. Yeah, and I'll just pick up on that in terms of minority shareholders specifically. Mark, maybe I can ask you this question. Um, so many corporate disputes usually get settled when a motion to dismiss is rejected by a court. And that's essentially because companies do not want to enter into trial. As Preeti was saying, uh, it is a very expensive process and arbitration might work better then. But would you say that an arbitration clause will protect minority shareholders in a corporation better? It's a great question. And I don't I, I, I don't know that I can answer that yes or no. Um, uh, you know, I, I think the motion to dismiss is a powerful tool in litigation that isn't typically uh you know available in arbitration i get that you know the siac and other institutions have sort of moved in the direction of uh instituting you know early dispositive motion practice but at least in my experience welcome the other panelists views if they disagree but in my experience if you're in arbitration you're likely going all the way to a hearing which in that sense, it is more protective of the um, the claimants, right? So a minority shareholder whose whose rights have been violated, um, you don't want to uh, have the controlling shareholder or the board of directors, you know, uh, able to terminate the case at the very beginning, um, you know, on a motion to dismiss. And particularly in Delaware, I mean, you all um, are familiar with, you know, the sort of powerful um, board friendly um, doctrines like the business judgment rule and uh, 102b7 and things like that. Um, now, the the flip side to what I just said is if you're representing, you know, a controlling shareholder or board of directors, you may not want to be in arbitration for that reason because you want to have the motion to dismiss. Now, it's more complicated than that on both sides because, you know, the ability to um, have uh you know leverage right uh in terms of if you're the um you know the defendant or the respondent of having the ability to knock out the case is one thing but if you're in court you're likely faced with a class action right which could be very different from um you know and i know that there is at least a possibility of class arbitration but like usually in arbitration it's sort of you know, maybe multiple claimants, but not, you know, like the class that represents every single share in, in the company. Um, and so, you know, from that perspective, um, you know, it's a little bit flipped, right? So that, that in that sense, um, the minority shareholders are better off in court where 
they have this threat of a huge, massive judgment against the defendants on a class-wide basis, whereas um, in you know in a sort of like one-on-one -on -one arbitration, um, they would they wouldn't necessarily have that uh, aspect. And then also, you know, confidentiality is a big factor. You know, it's true that not all arbitrations are confidential, but you do have the ability to. Um, keep things more under wraps in arbitration, obviously, than you do in litigation. And the Delaware Chancery litigation these days is highly, highly visible. Um, the chancellor and vice chancellors will write long, very colorfully worded opinions about, you know, the shenanigans that uh, the, the directors or the controlling shareholder um, may have engaged in, or at least are alleged to have engaged in, um, and that can be a powerful incentive uh, for uh, defendants to settle, to avoid that sort of publicity, which again points towards if you're a minority shareholder, you might want to be in court. Um, whereas if you are a you know, director or a controlling shareholder, you might want to be in arbitration. And so there's kind of like a push and pull, uh, you know, I've probably... Uh, uh, you know, gave a classic lawyer answer. It depends to that question, which is a good one. But I think there's just so many factors that have to be considered. Yeah, and and um, and I think if we are talking about minority protections, one of the first things that comes up is interim reliefs. And maybe Kevin, I can ask you this question. Uh, since you've seen you've seen the whole facet of this, what are the kinds of interim measures or reliefs that a minority shareholder or even the board of directors uh, should or can usually opt for in corporate governance disputes? Thanks. We've uh, So, so I, I've reviewed the SIC portfolio. I've ran through at least uh, or about 5,000 cases to look at the various types of interim reliefs. Maybe I'll just give a, a quick background on how this works uh, in arbitration. Of course, tribunals have very broad powers uh, to grant interim relief. And even when you have a valid and existing arbitration clause, there are still situations where you may be able to go to court. This is specified very clearly in the Singapore legislation. So if you needed an order against a third party, or if you needed ex parte relief, then you could go to the Singapore courts, even within the context, context of an arbitration. For me, the best way to understand it, uh, within arbitration, you can have an order that impacts a third party, but you can't have an order against uh, a third party. Now, the way that interim relief is granted in the context of arbitration is prior to the constitution of the tribunal, you can apply for the appointment of an emergency arbitrator. SIC has done, I think, more than almost any other institution in the world. Uh, we're, in the, we're in the throes of one right now, which is why this is actually a very convenient time for me to be on this webinar, is because we're working on that at the same time. So uh, that's prior to the constitution of the tribunal, and then post-constitution, you can apply to the tribunal. I think what's very interesting when we're looking at, at the matter at hand is also the standard that is going to be applied. And that's important uh, when you're planning the strategy for your case. Is it going to be local court standards? Are we going to use Article 17 of the model law? Is it going to be the transnational test? Is the way that an arbitrator, an emergency arbitrator or a tribunal decides, is that different uh, than the court? So I think most what we'll see most often is what I would or sort of somewhat loosely call a status quo uh, injunction. So that could be, say, minority sh uh, shareholders are seeking uh, prohibitory reliefs uh, to prohibit the other other side from selling shares, exercising voting rights, rates, voting in the extraordinary general me meeting, taking further liabilities, entering into new uh, agreements. We would also seen and have seen uh, Mareva injunctions, so where parties are looking uh, for a freeze to prevent potentially uh, the board of directors from dealing, disposing, or diminishing the value of whole or part of their assets. And then also, also mandatory injunctions. And usually this is going to be a higher hurdle uh, to, to clear. Uh, so this could be a situation where the other side has wronged or injured the minority shareholder, and they're asking the arbitrator to make uh, the other side uh, do some. We've seen disclosure the disclosure orders. So because of the asymmetry of information with minority sh shareholder holders, they might seek disclosure orders for the disclosure of the corporation's financial or accounting records and other re relevant uh, information. So those are 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 what we see. But 
Uh, it is a non-exhaustive list on in terms of the, the powers that a tribunal has to grant these interim reliefs. But it's also important to think from a tactical standpoint of what you're going to do uh, with this interim order. So you have, say, an emergency arbitrator's order or award, or you have this order from the tribunal, but you are likely going to need to take that to a different jurisdiction and try to go to the courts there to give effect uh, to that order. What is uh, very helpful in arbitration is that parties in arbitrations tend to voluntarily uh, comply uh, with these orders. Singapore, of course, is one of the very few jurisdictions that is provided for the enforceability of emergency arbitrator orders for both Singapore seated arbitrations and foreign seated arbitrations. But you do want to have uh, a plan in place of once you have this order, uh, how you're going to give effect uh, to that order from an emergency arbitrator or a tribunal in the various parts of the world where you might uh, need that relief. Yeah, and 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 Preeti, maybe I, I can get some of your thoughts on this as well, because I think Kevin gave us a list of possible um, interim reliefs that you can get. But in, in your experience, what do you think is the most effective? Um, I mean, I think Kevin has really comprehensively um, described what is available um, and what what is most effective is going to be extremely factually dependent. Um, but maybe uh, what I could do is just touch on um, a couple of uh, additional areas where um, interim relief uh, may be helpful uh, that, that Kevin hasn't mentioned. Um, you could get an order preserving evidence uh, right where there's a risk of a party damaging or hiding relevant evidence, you may need to apply for an interim measure to protect that evidence, um, deliver it up to safe custody or an order requiring your opponent to identify what the location of the evidence so you can ensure that it's um, kept safely. And then um, I'll mention, uh, although I know it's rare to to be granted in, in the context of international arbitration, security for costs. Um, this addresses the risk that costs may be uh, ordered against a party and the, that party may not be able to pay them, right? And it's unfair uh, to have, uh, if a respondent has successfully defended their claim, but then is unable to recover its costs from the claimant. Um, and so in those situations, the, uh, an arbitrator might, in exceptional situations, order security for costs. Um, although, again, it really depends. And I think this is more, um, I, I see it more often outside the U.S., where cost orders in favor of a prevailing party are far more commonly ordered than in the U.S., where parties um, pay their own costs. Um, I think that. That's probably uh, all I have to add to what Kevin said. Yeah, sure. Um, I, no, I, I think, again, that's it's helpful to know, especially in the context of security of course orders. Um, what, one uh, pretty reminded me of one thing that's um, not typically thought of as an interim measure, but it sort of acts very similarly in this context is um, advancement. Uh, so most companies will have general indemnification obligations to their directors and officers, sometimes shareholders, usually not. Um, and um, not only will the company um, agree to indemnify at the end of the case, uh, but often um, the company will agree in its bylaws or in a separate indemnification agreement to advance the defense costs of a director or an officer, even when it's the company itself who is suing the director or may even be a former director or officer um, and is you know, completely now um, adversarial with that person. Nonetheless, the director and officer usually has the right um, for the company to pay its defense cost, his or her defense cost. And so, you know, those it, it can sort of be collateral disputes and there often are disputes. The company will often not want to pay the fees for the director and officer that it is going after for whatever kind of malfeasance. Um, and so uh, there is usually, a, not usually, but a lot of times a collateral dispute 
which could be in court. Again, that's a lot of Delaware companies, you know, you see this type of litigation in Delaware Chantry, or could be um, in arbitration, you know, it may be the same arbitration, maybe a separate arbitration, but that is also um, a, um, a uh, type of dispute that you see a lot of times that takes place uh, as the main dispute uh, over whatever the corporate governance issue is proceeding. Yeah. Um, so I, thanks, Mark. Again, that's something that I didn't know a lot, but but thanks. That was very helpful. Um, I did want to touch a bit about, so we spoke a bit about courts versus arbitration and where arbitration makes sense for corporate governance disputes. But within arbitration as well, parties can either choose to uh, move institutional or ad hoc. And I think a question that a lot of parties think about is when you're when a company intends to include an arbitration clause in either their shareholder agreement or a joint venture agreement, in what circumstances would they prefer ad hoc arbitration over institutional? And maybe maybe Kevin being the institutional representative here, maybe you can you can kick that off. Well, uh, Vaishali, you you would have certainly seen me seen me going around India uh, uh, talking about the benefits of institutional arbitration over ad hoc, ad hoc arbitration. To me, there's actually very few circumstances where ad hoc arbitration would be definably an advantage over institutional arbitration. I think one of the misconceptions with ad hoc arbitration is that it will end up being more cost effective. Uh, than institutional arbitration. I think that we have a, a great benefit from the ICC uh, cost study that shows that the institutional fees tend to be around two or three percent of the overall costs of the entire arbitration. Tribunals fees may be around 17 percent. And then it's actually the legal costs uh, that are, are four fifths of the overall cost of the arbitration. What we found in our experience as well is there's also a direct relationship between the duration of an arbitration and those and those legal fees. I think most of us that have worked in arbitration, we all have that one very famous ad hoc arbitration story where parents end up naming their children after the ad hoc arbitration because it goes on for eight years, 10 years, 13 years. Uh, I just heard from one of one of my colleagues because it's you don't have that institutional referee uh, to guard due process going back to your first question, but also to make sure that the arbitration proceeds expeditiously. I think also the cost system that is used at some institutions compared to ad hoc arbitration can also encourage efficiency. So if arbitrators are being remunerated on an hourly rate, which is typically the case in ad hoc arbitration, they're not incentivized in the same way to make sure that arbitration proceeds expeditiously. It can almost become like an annuity uh, where you might have a few sittings every year and then the arbitration uh, goes on for a long period of time. Whereas if you have a system like at SIC, where the fees of the arbitrator and the institution are subject to maximums that are based on the sum and dispute, the tribunal in consultation with the parties needs to figure out that procedural schedule that works uh, for them from a re remuneration standpoint. I think if you are going to choose ad hoc arbitration, and I mean, to be fair, I think ad hoc arbitration can work quite well when you have sophisticated counsel, when you've uh, selected uh, a seat of arbitration with robust procedural rules. I think that where ad hoc arbitration can sometimes struggle is when things go sideways in the arbitration. If you are going to choose arbitration, I suggest that you overlay uh, that ad hoc arbitration, say, with the Uncentral arbitration rules. So you could have uh, a New York seat, Uncentral arbitration rules governing the procedure. And it's not under the auspices or the administration of an institution, but I think that gives more of those procedural safeguards that you want. Uh, you, you do have to be cognizant from a drafting st standpoint as well when you have an ad hoc arbitration. One of the advantages of institutional administration and institutional rules, and I look at it in a way that effectively parties are saving themselves the uh, difficulty of having to draft all of these customized provisions. So say like 10 years ago in our arbitration clauses, whether institutional or ad hoc, parties may have a very detailed procedure for the consolidation of multiple arbitrations. Now, at any of the leading institutions, you no longer, in most cases, have to provide for it because those institutional rules have provisions for consolidation. So I think that you have to be uh, a lot more careful with the drafting if you're choosing an ad hoc arbitration. But in most cases, but Vajali, as you would know, ad hoc arbitration clauses would typically be 
arbitration period, Singapore period. That would be your ad hoc uh, arbitration uh, clause. And then you're now bound to that subject to any variation to institutional rules. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that, actually, Kevin. And I know for a fact we've sent a few disputes your way as well, uh, back from India. And, and Mark, yeah, but we are very appreciative. <laughs> of course. Um, Mark, maybe maybe, um, maybe to you on this as well, because I, I would like to hear your thoughts on when when clients come to you and they, and they talk to you about uh, institutional versus ad hoc, what, what, where do you stand on this? How does it work with emergency reliefs specifically? Yeah, I mean, to me, this is an easy question. I don't really have anything to add to what Kevin said, other than from the practitioner's perspective, we never tell clients to do ad hoc. I mean, we, it's just a question of which institution, or, or sometimes it's a question of arbitration or litigation. But if they've decided arbitration, um, I mean, maybe I'll encounter in my career a time where it makes sense to recommend ad hoc arbitration, but I have not yet encountered that on the treaty ever has, but it's always, you know, a question between, you know, ICC, um, ICDR, you know, all of the major institutions, SIAC, right? Um, and, and they all have a lot of similarities, but there are some differences that can make, uh, you know, this type of dispute uh, more sensible for this type of institution as opposed to the other. Yeah, and uh, Preeti, do you want to add on to that? I, I think Mark mentioned you, if you have done ad hoc, what do you prefer on that? Yeah, I agree with everything that Kevin and Mark have said. Um, really, with ad hoc arbitration, you think you're saving money, but you're not most of the time. And it places a, a, a burden on the parties themselves. Uh, they're responsible for getting the proceedings in motion and moving them forward. And it can work well when you have sophisticated parties on both sides uh, and counsel on both sides and, and there's cooperation. But um, if, par if a party is not cooperative, then typically that means the arbitration is going to move slowly. You may need to go to the courts for assistance. It's very difficult sometimes even to get an arbitral tribunal in place. And so um, I, I agree with the bottom line, it, uh, you know, wouldn't ordinarily recommend ad hoc uh, over an institutional arbitration. I think that that's fair. Even if it saves a buck or two in the long run, you're you're making the wiser choice. If um, it does, and and I'm I'm not sure it does. Yeah. Um. So I I do want to just flag to uh, all our participants that there is a Q and A box. We are moving towards the end of our webinar. So if you do have questions. Uh, please do fill that in and, and we'll get right to that. Um, I, so since we are moving towards the end, we've spoken a lot about um, how arbitration works in corporate governance disputes. Now, I think the question that also comes up is what do you do with the award? Um, and that is what are what would be the typical concerns that a board or even a minority shareholder will face when they're seeking to enforce an arbitral award? And Preeti, maybe we can start with you and maybe Kevin can can bring in some of the procedural safeguards as well that we can include in that. Sorry, but Sorry. Sean, I think you cut out a little bit. Sure, I'll, I'll just repeat that. So uh, the question was, what are the typical concerns that either the board or a minority shareholder will face when seeking to enforce an award? Um, so I think, you know, when, when, uh, when a board or minority shareholder is looking at arbitration, they're gonna be concerned to make sure that a, a tribunal is quickly constituted, You're, they're able to get interim relief it proceeds efficiently and quickly. And then of course, as you mentioned, that the award itself is enforceable. And there are a number of ways along throughout that process that they can ensure that all of these things happen. Um, some of it is what we've just been discussing. Um, if you select institutional over ad hoc arbitration, you're typically, um, ensuring that the process proceeds more quickly and more efficiently. If you're choosing um, a set of arbitral rules that are 
recognized and that and, and avoiding local and untested arbitral rules, then that's one way in which you can secure the award and ensure that that process will work well and that the award you get at the end of the day will be will be enforceable. Um, you want to select a seat of arbitration um, in, in, in your arbitration clause that where the courts have a track record of supporting arbitration, of providing uh, the necessary support for interim relief and other remedies that may be required along the way. Um, you wanna, again, av avoid jurisdictions that are untested um, in terms of selecting the seat of the arbitration. Um, and, uh, you know, making sure that your arbitration clause is properly drafted is, is also a key part of that. Um, making sure that it provides for mandatory arbitration, that it doesn't have carve outs that might create um, disputes about whether a dispute was should be arbitrated or whether it should go to the courts. Um, and so those are some of the ways in which you can ensure that, that an award at the end of the day will be enforceable. Um, you wanna select arbitrators that are you know that have that also have a, a reputation and have uh, you know that a presiding arbitrator, for example, will manage the proceedings carefully and will and be able to render an award that um, complies with the bare minimum requirements for an enforceable award, ensuring the other side has notice a, a full opportunity to to be heard. Um, you know those are just some of the the bare uh, minimum things that you need to ensure that the award at the end of the day will be enforceable. Yeah, thanks, baby. Um, Kevin, do you want to, in your experience, when you've seen this, where do you see uh, awards being enforced easier in which situations do those arise? You know, <clears throat> you know, in arbitration, the, the the vast majority of awards are going to be voluntarily complied with. So enforcement uh, proceedings are actually the, the exception. So from an institutional standpoint, when I'm looking at parties, what I want parties to have is a plan for enforcement. Uh, so they've thought about where are they actually going to end up enforcing this award. They haven't just kickstarted an arbitration. They went green light on an arbitration without having a plan for, for enforcement. So from an institutional standpoint, we are looking first at compliance with the seat critically important that's probably the most important selection that you have when you're drafting an arbitration clause as as important as we might think that we are as uh as institutions there is a lot of convergence as mark said in institutional rules so with the major global institutions the, the institutional rules have a lot of similarities but the seat of arbitration is important because you may also need some of that court relief during the pendency of the arbitration from the seat court so you want uh, a court the curial court that provides uh, maximum support and minimal uh, intervention. So it's also, but from an institutional standpoint, it can be important to choose an institution that has the scrutiny of awards. So ICC and SIC are the two major institutions with the hope that I'm not forgetting anyone that review every award that is issued uh, in, an, in, in an arbitration. So we review and scrutinize uh, partial awards, in, interim orders, final awards, all of these are scrutinized where we review and we're trying to make sure that these awards are as enforceable as possible. The, the, the trick in these type of disputes, it, it really will be that unruly course of public policy. Are these disputes ultimately going to, to be found to be not against public policy at the eventual place of enforcement and they're going to find or to be arbitrable? So you can enforce an arbitral award in any number of jurisdictions. Really, it's that asset tracing exercise where you decide enforcement is going to be most advantageous to your case. And so you want to have that plan from the outset that you're in compliance with the seat of arbitration that has been chosen and you have a path to eventual enforcement. And the hope is with a properly run arbitration, there, there are not going to be those irregularity irregularities that is going to allow the resisting party to attack the award at the seat or potentially resist enforcement. Yeah, um, thanks, Kevin. That was, again, very helpful. Okay, so we've covered a lot of ground in this webinar, um, starting from the inception of the clause to its enforcement. And before I open it up for Q&A, um, just to summarize this discussion, uh, maybe, Mark, we can start with you. 
if you met a founder or a board member of a company, what are the key tips or tricks that you would suggest to each when including an international arbitration clause in key corporate agreements? And how would it differ for each? Yeah, it's uh, it's it's everything you know that we've talked about, right? It's thinking about um, you know what in terms of whether you want litigation or arbitration. What are the pros and cons, right? If you're a director, do you want to be sued in a public forum where you know there might be um, a written decision that people you know at Stanford Law School will read about in their textbooks, you know, 20 years from now? Do you want that? Um, or, you know, do you want to have the ability to file a motion to dismiss and get rid of the lawsuit um, at the beginning? Okay, you know, like once you've made the decision, do you want uh, litigation, arbitration, um, or maybe you want some claims to be litigated and others to be arbitrated, right? But, you know, talking about uh, you've decided now that you want some kind of dispute to be arbitrated, you know, uh, Kevin and Preeti talked about, you know, where it takes place, you know, what, what's the seat going to be, uh, which institution, like I said, it has to be, I think, uh, for any type of, um, you know, complex uh, corporate governance dispute, I think it, it really has to have um, the support of one of the, you know, the premier leading um, institutions. And, um, you know, is, is there anything else, you know, other bells and whistles that you want to put around it, you know, extra confidentiality, think about the types of interim measures that you would need or might need. Um, and, you know, just try to think through the eventualities. Obviously, nobody can uh, look into the future with a crystal ball, but, you know, you do the best that you can and try to imagine uh, a dispute and you know where you would like to be if that uh, eventually came to be yeah um thanks mark that that's a great summary kevin do you wanna kevin Preeti, do either of you want to pitch in on that sure I'll, I'll i'll maybe add just uh two two very quick points particularly because arbitrability might be an issue you want to be very cognizant of seat and you likely want to specify the governing law of the arbitration agreement so uh i mean just so that we have it all straight in our head you want the governing law of the contract seat of arbitration but also the governing law of the arbitration agreement and we'll leave to one side the impact of the place of incorporation if you do not specify the governing law uh of the arbitration agreement now we are going to get into uh a, a relatively detailed analysis whether it will be the law of the container contract that becomes the governing law of the arbitration agreement or whether it's the uh the lex arbitrary uh the law at at the seat uh of arbitration and i would also say that uh it should there there should be uh a delineation of the scope so what types of disputes do you want to refer to arbitration are there any carve outs without being overly pres prescriptive you don't want to end up having a dispute uh about the parameters of the dispute all right um, okay, so well, I, I, I think we're done with my questions, at least. Maybe we can open this up to questions from some of our participants. Um, so our, our first question is from Yuhan. She asks, do you think arbitration is a good way to solve disputes related to company dissolution as well? In that situation, the interests of the company's creditors may also get involved. Um, I'll open it up to, to either one of you, anyone who would like to answer that. Yeah, I mean, I, I'll take a stab at it, but curious what uh, Prudy and Kevin think. I, I, I tend to think probably not um, for exactly the reason Yuhan um, said, right? When you have uh, a situation where there are third party creditors um, who probably are not signatories to your arbitration agreements and you're affecting their rights, you, you probably just can't do that. And that's why um, these types of disputes tend to be, you know, in bankruptcy court where the bankruptcy court has, you know, like in rem powers over the estate and can bind, uh, you know, creditors, whether they like it or not, um, you know, subject to notice and opportunity to appear and due process. But um, you know, it, it maybe, I don't know, maybe there are ways that you can use arbitration um, to sort of get the same effect. But I think the magic of bankruptcy court, if you're a debtor, is that, you know, you can get the magic wand of the 
you know, first the automatic stay and then, you know, the discharge um, and confirmation um, uh, that all your debts have uh, disappeared, you know, subject to whatever the payment plan the court orders. And, I, you know, it's hard to see that being replicated in an arbitration. Yeah, maybe I would just add to that. I think I see a distinction between um, the types of disputes that Mark is referring to versus a an interpretation of the shareholders agreement where um, dissolution may be uh, prescribed as the agreed remedy, remedy in the event of a deadlock and the arbitrators are asked to um, interpret the agreement and uh, and, and and determine whether uh, that trigger is there a deadlock, for example, right? That is a pure contractual interpretation issue that does not then impinge on the rights of third parties and the interests of third parties, and is squarely within what I would see as the remit of the arbitrator in assess in determining any and all disputes arising out of the contract, which is a typical formulation uh, of an arbitration clause. Yeah, no, that's again right to the point. Um, I think maybe our next question is from an anonymous attendee. They ask, do you see a lot of arbitration cases in ESG topics on at zero claims upcoming in the near future? I, I don't see it's not directly related to corporate governance, but I, I think a general comment on ESG topics on at zero claims would be helpful. Yeah, I mean, I, I will say that um, ESG is a hot topic in corporate governance these days. Um, and you see it, you know, bleed into litigation in different ways in different jurisdictions. Like we've all seen uh, the big case in the UK, um, what is it against Shell? Um, and in the US, um, there have been, you know, cases brought, like, for example, in the Caremark, uh, you know, oversight uh, obligations context as well. Um, you know, will those cases be brought in arbitration? I don't think so. I think a part of the impact and the reason why those cases are brought is because they are public and, you know, brought sort of, um, uh, you know, for the PR, if, if you know, nothing else. Um, uh, but that having been said, um, my sense is that ESG issues are more and more, you know, they're everywhere. Um, and so I do think that there is going to be, um, you know, a lot of it uh, in arbitration um, going forward. I don't know that necessarily, you know, there will be cases that are entirely focused on ESG, but there will be related issues in arbitrations for sure. Um, I'm sure there already are. Um, uh, but even more so in as we you know progress uh, in the future. Yeah, and, and Kevin, have have you has the CAC seen a lot of ESG cases coming up? Yeah, it's a uh, uh, I I would echo uh, Mark's comments. So not disputes that are entirely relating to this, uh, but we are starting to see some of those disputes. Certainly, it's it is the favorite topic on the conference circuit. But it's actually eventuating into important issues in, in cases. It to me, it's a it's a very good area for any student uh, to start really becoming uh, au fait because I think that it is where we are going in the future, uh, and we're going to see a lot of these disputes in uh, ISDS. So you're going to see uh, treaty arbitrations uh, with some of these bases. So it's it's a it's a good and growing area for arbitration. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just maybe add. That was what I was going to say. I've seen it in my in my own practice. Um, it has come up primarily in the investor state space where um, you have uh, an investor bringing a claim against a state under an investment treaty, um, alleging, say, that the, the state expropriated their property, uh, for example, you know, revoked a license um, and the counter argument or the defense or sometimes the counterclaim by the state is well you were not complying with our laws on environmental uh requirements or regulations and so you you don't have sometimes it could be you don't have standing to bring this claim other times it is you may bring this claim but um we owe you zero in damages because you you haven't been a cor good corporate citizen so the 
So we've seen that um, in a number of investment treaty cases. Um, I think I agree with the comment that uh, it's likely to come into play as well in, in the commercial arbitration space. Um, I think it'll be more, typically more sort of ancillary, an ancillary issue that arises and, and most likely in commercial arbitrations that arise in certain sectors, um, you know, mining, oil and gas, uh, where ESG is becoming, you know, a lot more important. Um, I haven't seen it uh, yet in the commercial arbitration uh, space, but that that's what I, I see as a, the trend. Right, and, and Preeti, maybe I could just add a question on to that. Do, if you see it, um, if you see the clause in a, if an arbitration clause in a joint venture agreement of a mining and gas company, for example, um, would you would you think that the mining and gas company, in case of a dispute, pre would prefer commercial arbitration or go with with ISDS? Um, it's not necessarily a binary choice because you may have both operating in parallel. If you have a an agreement with a state owned entity that is that has an arbitration clause in it, you have the the possibility of of bringing a claim in in commercial arbitration. In certain circumstances, you may also have the parallel right to bring an investment treaty claim if the action or the measure you're complaining about is in fact a measure by the state that impacts um, your rights under an investment treaty. Thanks. Yeah. So you you may have both um, both options. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, I think our last question for the day, and, and I'll paraphrase this question a bit. Um, I, I, this is a good clarificatory way to end the webinar as well. It's it's by Thomas Bitters, and he said he asks if. Uh, arbitration, choosing arbitration seems to be a procedural choice as opposed to um, a statute or a substantial choice. And if this, uh, if his understanding is correct. Um, I might, I might take a stab and, and invite others to comment. Uh, I mean, I think it is, it is a procedural choice in the sense that arbitration is a procedure that allows you to resolve disputes outside the regular court system. Um, the entire uh, framework of arbitration is, of course, underpinned by statutes that um, require courts to give it, give effect to arbitration agreements, and and so. It's sort of underpinned, I think, by a whole framework of, of statutes. I don't know if that answers the question, but but that was uh, that's how I interpreted the question. Yeah, I think it answers it for me, unless Mark or Kevin want to add something to that. Yeah, I would only say um, I agree, um, but you know, a lot of times the nomenclature procedural versus substantive can mask that the procedural is incredibly important. And you shouldn't think that, you know, you would get to the same results in, for example, in arbitration as you would in, in a litigation, uh, just because the substantive law that will be applied is the same, right? You might uh, have very different results, or you might not, you might have the same results. But a lot of times procedure can be just as important um, than, you know, as the substance. Yeah, well, Kevin, um, any thoughts before we, I, I let you all go. Uh, all right. I, I, I would just echo those comments, uh, uh, but maybe uh, a topic for another webinar is, is many of the different issues ar ar which arise, w whether they're categorized as or procedural law or substantive law can be important uh, in any dispute resolution process, particularly arbitration. Thanks, Kevin. I think we got our topic for the next webinar now. Perfect. <laughs> um, but, well, yes, um, thank you all so much. This really did feel like a crash course on uh, corporate governance disputes and how we can use international arbitration. Um, and again, I would really like to thank you for taking the time out and for being here. Thank you, Vaishal, and thanks everyone. I appreciate it. Yes. Thanks, same. everyone. Thank you. Really. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks. Okay. Bye.